It's my pleasure today to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Benjamin Rice. Dr. Rice is a presidential postdoctoral research fellow in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Princeton University. He completed his doctorate in the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University, focusing on the ecology and evolution of malaria in Madagascar. His current work centers on genomic and serological analysis of infectious diseases across various community and ecosystem settings in Madagascar. Dr. Rice will also introduce his colleagues from Madagascar who will be available to answer questions during our Q&A session at the end of the talk. Yeah, thank you so much for the nice introduction and for the invite. It's a privilege to be here. It's also a privilege to be speaking on behalf of a large team of colleagues uh, mostly based in Madagascar, where we do our work. Um, so just a quick moment, I'm going to introduce the other colleagues who will be joining us today uh, for this presentation, and then we'll be um, guest lecturing in a course later this afternoon. So we have Dr. Maheri Rebalia, who's a specialist on malaria research in Madagascar. Uh, and we're also joined by Dr. Sarara Beheri Sua, who worked at the Ministry of Health in the National Malaria Control Program and has joined the team uh, to work on malaria projects and focusing on genomics and the importation of malaria from high incidence districts in particular. And last, we're joined by Sylviane Mihari Sua, who is an entomologist um, and working on this project as well. They'll be around to answer questions uh, when I finish presenting today, and they'll be doing some events with the students uh, in the next two days, over the next two days. So today I'm going to talk about work that we've done on the ecology of infectious disease in the context of a changing world. And I'll be more specific about that, but I'm going to use three exemplars, coronaviruses, malaria, and the geographic context of Madagascar. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge, because this is a large team effort, um, we're joined by Dr. Maheri, who leads the group uh, that works in Mananzari, a district in southeastern Madagascar. So there's a large team there that's led by Dr. Virginie Radisua and Dr. Ellen Nerina, Andrea Noeli Vululuna, who lead our work there. Uh, here's a picture of the team and our local collaborators. Um, I also want to thank uh, people from various other institutions that have funded or made this work possible, including the 2016 to 2018 Mahari field team in Madagascar, shown here. Uh, and so today I want to discuss our work to address two fundamental questions in disease ecology. What determines the number and diversity of infectious diseases that circulate or commonly circulate in human populations? Um, and to be more specific, what dictates the limits, if there is a limit, to the number or diversity of pathogens that spread widely in human populations? And second, I wanted to talk about what drives spatial variation in pathogen transmission, or be more particular, uh, focus on our work to understand what drives variation in the transmission of infectious diseases across a landscape and why there is so much variation. Um, our analysis of the second question is informed by data that we've collected in Madagascar, whereas the first question is largely theoretical work. For that reason, I'll focus on the second question, spatial variation and pathogen transmission, first using, again, malaria as an example. Uh, to give some context for those not familiar with the malaria state of affairs in the world currently, there was a large amount of progress seen in the control of malaria from the year 2000 to 2015. Here, for example, in a publication by uh, Bot et al. In, 19, in 2015, published in Nature, they estimated the extent of malaria prevalence among children in Africa in 2000, and they're showing that on this map here on the left where yellows, oranges, and reds show increasing prevalence of malaria among children in Africa. Then they repeated this estimation uh, in 2015 and compared countries. This middle panel is showing countries in Africa ranked in terms of the amount of malaria they had in the year 2000, and then where they are or estimated to be in the year 2015. The individual country names may be difficult to see, uh, but the overall pattern is hopefully clear that all of those lines, or most of those lines, are trending downward, showing large, significant, substantial decreases in the amount of malaria in African countries between the year 2000 and the year 2015. And then here, shown as a map, they've taken those estimates and applied them uh, on this map here, showing that, that 
large, there's much fewer areas in Africa in the year 2015 that are colored in those yellows, oranges, and reds, indicating high malaria prevalence among children. However, despite that progress that we saw in Africa, in this case, and globally in the control of malaria from that 15-year period, 2000 to 2015, since 2015, that progress has largely stalled. And this is reflected in some papers and correspondences and letters that public health leaders are writing and publishing in journals like The Lancet, where they say things like, have we really failed to roll back malaria? The message is clear, progress is stalled. Um, and there's this article from the British Medical Journal in 2019 that sort of correlates with these increasingly frantic calls from the WHO World Health Organization saying we need more to reverse these stalls that we're seeing. In particular, the BMJ article highlights that it's in these high instance areas. So it's not that malaria progress stalled just consistently across the board. Places that were bad for malaria stayed bad, and they've been that way since 2015, um, and more work is needed. For students, I encourage this long-form journalistic style piece. It's not a scientific publication. It's a, like a journalist went to investigate this further, titled, published in Science last month in September, titled Lingering Fever, about the battle against malaria in Africa, in this case, focusing in Mozambique. Reflecting this stall in progress, here's the number of deaths due to malaria since 2016. Through, from 2016, 2017, 18, 19, 20, 2021. As you can see, the number of deaths has not gone down. In fact, it's gone up since 2015. Just again, reinforcing this message that progress is stalled or even reversed in the control of malaria, which motivates our work, in this case, in Madagascar. So turning to Madagascar, we've seen that same global pattern reflected at the national level. So this is data from National Malaria Indicator Surveys where they go out and randomly sample hundreds of clusters, small clusters in the population, and try to estimate regionally the amount or the prevalence of malaria. And they do that every couple of years. The first one was in 2011, and in 2013 they repeated this process. 2016 they repeated the process as well. And as you can see clearly from this pattern, large regions of the country are getting more red over time. This is the opposite of progress. Things are getting worse since 2013 in Madagascar. They finished a survey in 2021, but unfortunately they haven't made the same color-coded map yet, so I just quickly pulled out some estimates from a couple regions in Madagascar where prevalence in the most recent national estimates ranges from 12 to over 30%. And by prevalence for students who may not have used that term before, it's just the fraction of the population that's carrying parasites at a given time. So this is in the south, in the Anusi region in Madagascar, for example, almost a third of individuals have malaria parasites in their bloodstream at the time of sample. Again, showing not progress, but stalled or reverses in our progress on malaria control. And so why may this be? We can come up with a couple hypotheses as to why malaria control progress is stalled in Madagascar. We can separate these into epidemiological factors and ecological factors. Epidemiological factors could be there's insufficient access to prevention or insufficient access to treatment. Ecological factors could be disturbances to the local environment that increase the risk of malaria transmission or disturbances such as extreme weather decreases access to healthcare infrastructure, destroys healthcare infrastructure, makes populations more vulnerable. Uh, to talk about the ecological factors first, um, a pattern that's seen in Madagascar and globally is the large amount of forest loss or deforestation that's occurred in the last 50 years and is continuing in, the, in recent decades. So this is a study by uh, Sam Myers and others on the left, uh, published in The Lancet in 2017, showing the amount of tropical forest loss since the year 1900. As you can see, uh, that has continued unabated in recent years. And I'll make the specific link to malaria on the next slides. This also applies to Madagascar in a paper from Conservation Letters in 2008. They summarize or visualize the loss in remaining forest between the year 1950 and the year 2000. As you can see, by the lack of coloration as you get to 2000, they've colored their forest by different forest types. Um, but you can just see the general pattern. There's a lot less of it in 2000. But how does this link to malaria? Oh, first, I wanted to make a point, sorry, before I get to the malaria link, 
is that this loss of forest on Madagascar is exceptionally sad. I'm in an EEB department where we think about ecology, conservation, and things like that. This is especially sad because those forests in Madagascar that are disappearing house some incredible fauna, different types of animals, including lemurs, the world's largest chameleon, the world's smallest chameleon, and others that are threatened, in addition to the risk for malaria transmission, which I'll now show. And so we can hypothesize a linkage between deforestation or habitat disturbance and a change in malaria transmission or vulnerability in local communities by noting that when forests fragment, it creates more habitats that are suitable for the larval, for the mosquitoes, in this case, Anopheles mosquitoes that transmit malaria. Intact forests don't have a lot of standing water, and the standing water they do have is shaded, whereas a cleared or fragmented forest has a lot of sunlight, a lot of clearings that get in touch the ground, uh, and all that erosion that happens, you get increased flooding and collection of stagnant water that's hit by the sun, warmed up, and that becomes more suitable for the vector species that transmit malaria. Or just to conceptualize this simply, uh, on the bottom I'm showing in a more intact forest, you have a few Anopheles mosquito sites that are suitable, and a more fragmented forest that goes up. Forest fragmentation increases the suitability of the landscape to the vectors that transmit malaria, and that through various mediating factors can lead to a change or increase in the risk of malaria in local communities. Uh, so that's uh, the, about disturbances to the local environment. Turning next to extreme weather. Uh, for context, Madagascar is a global hotspot for cyclones. A hurricane is when it happens in the Atlantic Ocean. A cyclone is when it happens in the Indian Ocean. It's equivalent to hurricanes. But here, for example, I'm showing the paths of every recorded hurricane, or cyclone in this case to be more correct, that touched Madagascar from 1950 to 2021. Um, there were 61 of these cyclones, and this is, would be equivalent to a Category 1 hurricane and above. So these aren't small storms. These are major events. Um, and I believe there were 61, if I'm not wrong on that number, that made contact with Madagascar over the last 72 years. And for comparison, Florida has had about 45 to 50 over the same time period using the same uh, criteria. So Madagascar gets hit by cyclones more than Florida does. This would be the take home message here. And those large storms can have massive impacts. Dr. Mahiri de Balia will discuss them in class some uh, later this afternoon. But they can, one can imagine how they could destroy health facilities directly. And we have evidence of this occurring. They could destroy the roads that connect people to health facilities. They can cause flooding and disruptions that can affect the mosquito population. They can wash away people's homes and bed nets, increasing vulnerability. And these are thought to become more and more common as the, as the Indi Indian Ocean surface temperatures increase. Uh, next, turning to epidemiological factors. These are a little bit more straightforward. But as one would expect, malaria prevention is not perfect in Madagascar. Here, I apologize for forgetting to translate these titles, but it's the percent of the population with access on the left to a bed net, at least one per house, by different regions of Madagascar. And so that percentage doesn't reach 100%, and in some regions, it's quite low. And then here mapped is the percent of households that possess a bed net uh, with those different regions of Madagascar mapped. In this case, redder is not more malaria. Redder is fewer bed nets. And we work on this East Coast. Um, but one important note to make, even though some of these East Coast regions, like Vatuvavi, Fitu, Vinani, which I will try to highlight here, even though 90% of the households have a bed net, that's sort of incomplete information, because we don't know what fraction of the children living in those fit under that one or more bed nets they have in the household. And so some of Sylviane's data and work shows that you have children in the household, you have six children in the household, and only the youngest child is sleeping under a bed net, and the other children are not. And so even though that 90% may seem like success, that's insufficient because it's not 100%. It's also insufficient because among those that do have a bed net, some of those households need more bed nets. Uh, we could also think about access to treatment. So this is when prevention fails and someone isn't infected with malaria. How likely are they to receive anti-malaria uh, medicines, diagnosis for malaria, and anti-malarial treatments? Um, so here, just breaking Madagascar into four rough geographic categories, east coast, west coast, south, and high plateau. Um, we can compare the percent of children that had fever 
that received a diagnosis and treatment in 2011, 2013, 2016. The overall pattern, which may just be obvious, but I'll say it anyway, is that we're not getting above, in any year, in any region, we're not getting above 20% of, 27% of children that have access to malaria diagnosis and treatment. There's a large dependence on those bed nets to prevent malaria infection from occurring, which is good, prevention is always better than treatment, but for those, I guess we could call them breakthrough cases, even though it's not the same as a vaccine failure breakthrough case for COVID or something, but those cases where, despite bed net campaigns, children uh, are getting infected, very few of them after getting infected are able to get tested and treated. That's the overall pattern, is we're below 30% in all regions of Madagascar for all years after infection occurs. We can also note that between 2011, 2013, and 2016, which is the data that's available, this seems to have gotten worse in most regions of the country. Again, we can think of, we, uh, I'll just highlight the East Coast, for example, um, where 27, in 2011, things were better than they were in 2013 or 2016. 13.1 you know, and 13.3 percent of children that had fevers were getting tested and treated for malaria in 2013 and 2016, which is less than half of what was achieved in 2011. So we're trending in the wrong direction. Is that, that's an important point for going forward, so I just wanted to like hammer it home repeatedly. I'll stop belaboring it if everybody's on board with that. The high plateau, last thing I'll say on the slide, it looks a little bit different, but that's because it's high elevation. There's not as much malaria there. It's up in the mountains. It's cooler, it's drier, it's more urban. Not as relevant for malaria, but we can focus on the coastal regions where there's a lot of malaria. Uh, so it's sort of like we can refine the original broad fundamental question we had about how uh, infectious disease vary over space. So something more concise or more concrete I guess is a better word than concise. How do epidemiological and ecological factors interact to drive persistently high malaria transmission in some areas? And so to address this question, we would need data, right? Like we need data on epidemiological factors, we need data on ecological factors, we need data on the malaria outcome. If this data was pre-existing, this talk would end on the next slide. But what is the deficiency in the existing sets of data? And so what motivated our work to collect that data? We can separate data collection strategies into two broad types. Passive data collection, where you have hospitals or health facilities that wait for individuals to seek care, come to the health facility, be recorded and reported to a centralized database. We can call those passive data collection systems. And those suffer from an obvious flaw. If people don't go to the health facility, they never get counted. And so the fraction of the true positives that are recorded is gonna be much smaller a fraction of positives that are individuals that are infected with malaria that's recorded is always going to be much less than the true number that's out there circulating in the community. Um, and so here's data from Mananzadi District that we collected, led by Mahedi Ribalia here, um, at the baseline sample in July to October 2021, where we were asking individuals about recent fever, fever within the last two weeks. Of those with fever, how many went to seek and perform a malaria rapid diagnostic test? And then those that performed the test, did they receive treatment? And so not all fevers are malaria. There's other infectious diseases that exist in these areas. Madagascar doesn't have a lot of dengue and Zika, but in other parts of the world, that's a major cause of fever. Um, you can have typhoid causing fever. You can have respiratory infections. There aren't major COVID waves happening, as I think some, a note had made. That's not explaining this data that everybody got COVID this week. And that's why they're not doing malaria tests because they already know it's COVID. These are really rural areas with very low COVID circulation. So something like 17% of individuals had a fever in the last two weeks, which um, if we just stop to think about, that means a large fraction of your population is suffering at a given moment. 17% is an insane number of people to have fever in the last two weeks. If we did the same thing on Rice University's campus, I hope that number would be much less, probably like 0.1% or something, 1%, 2%. Um, but of those individuals that had fever, less than 2% uh, received uh, testing. Or to state it more clearly, I think I stated that slightly wrong. So 17% of the population reported fever. 2% of the population did a test for malaria. And again, we think malaria is the main cause of fever in this area. So all, th th these bars should be the same height. 
everybody who has a fever should be getting tested for malaria in this area. But only a small fraction of them are. And then of those, some of them tested positive for malaria, about half, and received anti-malarial treatment. So the bottleneck doesn't seem to be that people are testing positive but not getting treatment. It's just that they're never getting tested. They're never going to a health facility. And so data collection systems that are dependent on health facilities have a major problem because they're not going to count these individuals correctly. And for reference, 33% of the population at this sampling time window, July to October 2021, was positive for malaria. So about half the people who have malaria have symptoms. And then of those, a very small number get tested. And RDT is rapid diagnostic test for malaria, similar to the rapid COVID test on the little plastic cassette that many of you all have done a lot of recently. Another type of data collection system is active systems. So this is where a team actively goes out, randomly samples the population, and then summarizes what's going on. They do have these in Madagascar every two to three years. These are these national malaria indicator surveys. Here's the data from the 2016 survey. Uh, but the problem is they're very labor intensive. You have to go out and randomly recruit people from all over the country to a survey, test them, report that data. In Madagascar, no country is able to do this continuously. So they do it in these large campaigns every couple of years. So that data is coarse. It's both temporally coarse because we don't have an update since 2016, pending preliminary results from 2021. Uh, but it's also geographically coarse because they have a small number of individuals from a lot of localities. But then they summarize it into these broad regions, like the east coast of Madagascar. Here they're saying has 9% prevalence on average. But the east coast of Madagascar, that's like a, a thousand miles or something like that from the north to south. Madagascar is a big island. So the area is about the size of Texas, but it's shaped more elongated. So it's maybe more like the size of California, if you think about it. So this data is not satisfying, or it won't allow us to get at our questions. Um, so we need new data collection approaches. So in 2016, uh, we launched a cross-sectional study across Madagascar. This is work led by Mahiri, the Madagascar Health and Environmental Research, uh, research NGO that we work with. Um, and this is work I did for my PhD, where we went across five different regions of Madagascar, recruited something like 1,200 households and 8,000 individuals, and tested them for malaria. And I think one important thing to point out is these are clustered samples. So we go to six villages or six communities in different regions and then test a lot of people for malaria. And I'm showing the, the results here uh, on the right side of the screen. To highlight the Northeast first, um, that's partially covered by the Zoom thing. But we just did genomic sequencing to confirm some of these observations. So we, we're using malaria rapid diagnostic tests primarily. But just to say that we went back in and tested them using PCR and then sequencing the parasites just to make sure we don't have some weird thing going on with our rapid diagnostic tests. But for the rest of the talk on malaria today, I wanted to focus on this region in the southeast. And the one observation we can make is there's a lot of variation. Some villages in the southeast, two of the six that we sampled that we're looking at the data here, had prevalence over 40%, a lot of malaria. And then some that are nearby are three, four, five, six, seven percent. And these are villages that are you know, just around the corner, just on the other side of the hill, and very similar. They're all rural, no road access, no electricity. Um, so that's a sort of interesting result that we wanted to follow up. And so we launched a study in 2020. To focus on the southeast again in Mananzari, here we're looking at the percent of households that have a given number of malaria infections at the time of sample in 2017. And if we look at Mananzari, you can see that uh, getting close to half of the households have at least one individual, uh, or no, sorry, this is uh, the number of households that have that number of infections. So we have 51 of our sampled households have at least one, have one case of malaria, and 22 of those households have four or more cases of malaria at a time. So we've sampled something like hmm, 250, 300 households total in this area, uh, and a large fraction of them have a, 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 at least a malaria infection at the time of sampling. Another way to look at this data is we could break it out by village. And again, there's some villages in this region of Madagascar where nearly every single household has a malaria infection. And a majority of households and some have more than one individual infected with malaria at that time. Just to highlight the burden there. 
and how drastically that differs from other sites in that same region, same vicinity, same ecology, same landscape, where you have only a tiny number of households in the area. And here, like, household would be parents, grandparents, siblings, everybody that lives and eats together. And in Madagascar, those households can get quite large. You have, I think we had a household of 19 individuals um, sampled in here. And in this paper, if you're interested in more, we went into and we broke it down because the households vary in their size. So if you have a lot of big households, then obviously you're going to get some households that have multiple infections with malaria if you have a little bit of malaria. So we controlled for that. And you can look up the more, detail, more details there. And so we have these pattern, this pattern of hot spots of malaria transmission. I'm going to use that term for the rest of the talk. Where you have within an area that has malaria, it's exceptionally hot in certain spots. Um, and are they, they occur at like a small spatial scale. Again, all of these are close. But are those hot spots, do they mean anything? Is malaria just randomly moving across the landscape and there's waves like we see in COVID, such that this village is really hot this month, it's going to be the next village the next month? Or are they stable? In which case, we need to target, in this case, you know, village 05 and 06 for consistent intervention going forward. So to get at that question, we launched a study, a cohort study in 2020, a prospective open cohort study uh, in the Mananzadi district in southeastern Madagascar. Here's Dr. Rina giving a malaria diagnostic test, for example. This happens to be the mayor of the commune that lives in there who, to show his support for the project, asked to be photographed while he was being sampled or being tested. So our methodology is we recruit 500 households. We recruited 500 households. We follow them monthly, collect data on them monthly, continuously throughout the year uh, for multiple years. Uh, and in those 500 households, there's a total of about 2,500 individuals. We test and treat for malaria. Here's the boat we use on the left panel uh, that we use to get to those sites because in this district, there's no roads. Everything's on inland waterways and canals and river systems. Here's an example of what a rural community in that area looks like pre-cyclone. So just some quick preliminary results. This is an active area of research, and we're continuing this. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of the preliminary results, but we haven't answered the question, like what's going on in these sites yet. But here's a couple indications that we see. This is variation in bed net usage and quality across the 10 sites that we've surveyed or sampled for this project. And the yellow color is individuals that did not use a bed net. The gray individual, is low, the gray bar, gray portion of the bar, is the individuals that are using a bed net, but it's poor quality or damaged. We have follow-up detail on the size of the hole of the bed net. Is the bed net hole the size of your finger or the size of your head, things like that? Or has it been ripped and the extent to which it's damaged? But I lumped all of those together. It's just the individuals that are using a bed net, but it's of suboptimal quality. And then in blue, dark blue, is, for example, here is the fraction of individuals that are using a bed net that still has minimal damage or no damage. What are some patterns we see here with this data? Uh, and the x-axis, sorry, is that over time. So we have different time points of sampling. I'm showing the first six time points separated for each site. For example, north one is the site north of the center of the transect. So patterns we see here is one thing that jumps out to me, at least, is this S3 in the middle on the top row has considerably lower bed net usage than other uh, nearby communities. Uh, but if we only, if you sort of like exclude the gray and the yellow, uh, which I guess I could have done in the PowerPoint to make this even easier, but pretend I did that, and you just remove or erase the gray and the yellow and only think about the bar, uh, that blue bar, you see concerning drops in bed net usage over time in some sites. For example, site N2, if we focus on these blue bars, there's uh, sort of less than half of the individuals are using a high quality bed net by time point six here. Okay. And if we look at malaria prevalence, this is sort of like prevention, use of these households of prevention. Next obvious indicator to look at is we can just see how often are the malaria tests positive over these same six time points. We had a little bit of data from time point seven that I'm showing for some of those sites. The lack of data for T7 for here, for example, is not that we eliminated malaria in our project one. We just that sampling hasn't been done yet. It's in progress as we speak, I think, for 10.7. Um, 
there, there's a couple of different patterns I want to walk you through on this, but just to orient everybody for this figure, this is trends in malaria prevalence in this district in modern anxiety since we launched the project in July 2021. At the time I made this figure a couple weeks ago, there was over 10,000 uh, like individual observations of malaria uh, that we're putting in here. And I'm showing the baseline sample in red, and then the project starts. And again, the project is a mobile clinic, goes to the community, tests people, and treats them for malaria. So our ability to observe the prevalence is somewhat modified by the fact that we're, like, we're running a malaria control program in order to detect malaria prevalence. Does that make sense? That's why I'm asking everybody to consider this baseline sample a little bit separately from the follow-up data points. At baseline, you know, there, as we saw in a previous figure, very few people when they get malaria are going to get treatment or um, testing, testing or treatment. Uh, we've now solved that problem. We've eliminated barriers to care because we put the team on a boat and we all go out there together and we line everybody up that wants to do that, enrolls in the project and sends them to the project and they're getting tested and if they're positive, they're treated. So one thing that we can note is just if we look at that baseline sample, some of the sites had an insane amount of malaria at the baseline sample. For example, Ambala Vuntika, this top uh, panel on the left, uh, top left panel, almost 60% of the individuals, this is all age groups combined, were positive for malaria when this project started. We've reduced that number down to uh, 8%. You could ask Dr. Mahedi for the exact number, he'll have that handy. But it's something like 8% currently um, is one pattern. So there's this big gap, and I think the gap we're seeing is when you provide access to care and treatment after this baseline sample, the data somewhat suggests that that's biting into the prevalence a decent amount. We don't have control sites, so we can't do a formal analysis saying our intervention caused this, but ongoing work to rule out some sort of alternative explanations. We can also compare to the hospitals and clinics in the area, which aren't seeing the same declines in malaria rates that we're seeing at the sites that we follow. But again, we don't have any control. We didn't randomize and assign our treatment, our project intervention to a subset of sites and then monitor control sites. Um, and so uh, that's ongoing, but just to, there's probably some effect there. I think we can all agree that there's probably some effect by coming in and treating hundreds of people for malaria, probably gonna affect malaria transmission in an area. The other interesting, the other point I wanted to make, because we could think about this as sort of uh, uh, if you think about randomized control trials considered the gold standard of public health evidence, trying to run a randomized control trial to better understand these dynamics may be impossible because in order to really understand what's going on, we have to go out and actively test people. And if somebody tests positive, obviously we have to treat them. So there's this observer effect that may be impossible to fully address. You can't have a true control site. One point. The last point I wanted to point out on this slide is that for some sites, and for me this is clearest on this top right uh, site here, site S6, Masanjano Kili, and you see this sort of like consistency, approximate consistency over time. Prevalence was sort of high, it was among the highest in the sites of the baseline. It dropped after the project starts, and we're going out there with a the mobile clinic to provide access to care and treatment. We don't eliminate malaria, malaria stays high 15, 20, 25% over time. It's not fluctuating wildly between seasons. And it stays in comparison to the other sites. If we think about Masanjan and Kili at time point six and seven and compared to other sites, the sites that it's higher than, it stays higher than. The sites that it's lower than, it stays lower than. And that pattern, like the reverse of that could maybe be seen in this site on Pandimana, where it's you know, fairly low prevalence at baseline in early time points, it stays low. So this pattern of high staying high and low staying low sort of indicates that those hot spots are stable. The sites that have a lot of malaria have a lot of malaria predictably over time. The alternative pattern would be if what's high at time point one is low at time point two, is high again at time point three, is low again, and sort of like random fluctuations, and we don't see that pattern. And the public health implication of that would be that sort of we can prioritize certain sites that deserve longer term consistent intervention because we know that investing and treating at that site is going to pay off because that's where a lot of malaria infections are happening, and predictably over time. I tried to make too many points on this slide, but hopefully that main point comes through, that high is staying high and low is staying high, to a rough approximation from this first glance at the data. The other thing I wanted to note is that there was sort of like a, a cyclone, preliminary evidence, they should say, for the cyclone effect, 
So at time point two, a cyclone hit, and it hit all of these sites at the same, the same day, same time. So at time point two, this massive cyclone came through, destroyed a large fraction of the houses, a large fraction of the, of the health facilities, roads, things like that in this area. Um, a lot of people lost their homes, lost their bed nets, and things like that. This massive effect happened between time point two and time point three. Does the data really reflect that? No, to me, from a, you know, a first approximation. There's a little bump between time point two and three, but if we added a confidence interval here, that's probably just like random fluctuation, random noise. And in some sites, there's a drop between time point two and three. Uh, I think here was one of the examples I wanted to point out, which is interesting. So the cyclone was a dramatic event. Um, it, it, there's the one hypothesis is the cyclone just washed all the mosquitoes away. The wind was, you know, 100 miles an hour, crazy amounts of flooding. All the larvae got washed away. All the mosquitoes got blown away. And it took the mosquitoes long enough to reestablish that by then the situation of housing and stabilized and things like that. The alternative hypothesis is because we had a mobile clinic that went out there and responded to the cyclone, we were able to cover that gap in access to care that emerged because of the cyclone by having people in the field um, working with the teams. And again, more questions can be directed to Dr. Mahiri. So to summarize and discuss future directions before I move on to the pathogen diversity and coronavirus portion of the talk, I'll spend only a couple minutes on that, is uh, we want to continue this longitudinal data collection in the Mononzati district to get at that stability, did that pattern of stability over time, high staying high, low staying high, consists for multiple years. There's really strong evidence that we can you know, find a subset of sites that need much more intensive effort. We also want to expand this mobile clinic approach because we do see some sort of evidence that the mobile clinic has some effect on the dynamics to additional communities. Um, and we want to integrate with the mosquito work led by Sylvian and some other factors that are at play there, including nutrition. So that was a quick, it uh, wasn't quick, but that was a discussion of our work in Madagascar based on malaria. I wanted to transition to the next sort of like broad question that motivates my work or a lot of the work in our research group. And that is what, is, what is driving pathogen diversity? Why are there the number of pathogens circulating in humans that there are? Why does that number change when there's a disease emergence event? And what do we think will happen in the future? And one example of this that we're all way too familiar with is these waves of coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2 infection that have occurred since late 2019 and continuing to this day. that have swept across at various time points um, uh, the states in this country. But if we think of, if we zoom out a little bit and think about other things, the last two decades have just been peppered with disease emergence events. I'm sure everybody remembers Ebola, which has popped up multiple times. Some of y'all, maybe not the students who were born around this time, but the SARS-CoV original SARS-CoV infections, 2002, 2003, um, dengue outbreaks, cholera, Zika. The uh, recent history, or the recent last two decades have been peppered with disease emergence events. If we think about the coronaviruses alone, there seems to be like, you know, more than one coronavirus a decade popping. MERS-CoV-2, for those who aren't familiar, is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. It's a zoonosis from camels that's infected and led to some clusters. That's high death rate. There was one large outbreak in a hospital in South Korea that's alarming because uh, usually it's like confined to people that have close contact to camels in their contact. But uh, I just wanted to remind everybody that in addition to these emergent coronaviruses, SARS, MERS, SARS-CoV-2, there are endemic coronaviruses. There's four common cold-like coronaviruses that I, for example, didn't, I think I'd heard of them briefly, but had probably forgotten. But then when the SARS-CoV-2 outbreak happened, they became a little bit more known. So I don't know how many of you were familiar with these prior to the SARS-CoV-2 outbreak. But there are four common cold, um, less uh, virulent coronaviruses that circulate um, broadly. And so this is data from Scotland, actually. They're showing that there's outbreaks of these every year. And so the question is, if multiple coronaviruses are emerging per decade, and some of them are able to persist why were there only four among us? So humans have been around for thousands of years, centuries. Humans have lived in cities for centuries. There's you know, four that can circulate for a long time in humans and have outbreaks every year. In the last two decades, three have popped out. Why don't we have hundreds and hundreds of coronaviruses circulating in human populations regularly, or dozens? 
I guess we don't have to be so extreme to say hundreds, but it, it seems a little bit uh, counterintuitive that despite all this evidence that coronaviruses are very, you know, very able to, to do these things, only four have sort of permitted. Now this number is five. And so if we compare this rate, like multiple coronaviruses emerging per decade, if we extrapolate that back over time, um, you know, over the last century alone, we might expect 10, 15, 20 other coronaviruses to, popped out, to have popped out. Why didn't those stick around is the question. There's a couple possible explanations for the surprising mismatch. And this is a theoretical sense. And again, we don't have data on this. Um, but I just wanted to pose these questions and use an ecological framework for a couple more minutes before wrapping up today. One possible explanation is there are more coronaviruses. We just haven't observed them or counted them yet. The evidence that maybe this isn't the most likely explanation is that the viral discovery, the pace of viral discovery, has flattened or slowed in recent years. You know, in 1960s, 70s, 80s, they discovery new viruses all the time. Recently, that's sort of slowed. That indicates there's probably not hundreds more viruses out there in humans that commonly infect humans that are waiting to be discovered. Maybe some, but not a lot. The other thing is that we're capturing the rare emergent infections, like MERS-CoV-2. So if we're able to observe something like MERS-CoV-2, MERS-CoV, sorry, if we're able to observe MERS, which just infects camel herders and things like that, um, how would we miss an infection that's in circulating among millions or billions of people? It seems unlikely, right? Another possible idea is that the last two decades have been not representative of previous decades of human history. Spillover has rapidly, non-linearly accelerated in the last two decades. And there might be some evidence for this, right? We know that the intensity of anthropogenic disruptions to natural systems is accelerating. That it leads to, can lead to more contact between humans and viral reservoirs. Also, travel has exploded in recent decades. So perhaps viruses were spilling over but in some place that was not connected globally previously. This is flight routes available to humans in 1933 and here in 2020. Perhaps spillovers are occurring at the same rate, but just going global more rapidly. But again, like in 2018, or sorry, in 1918, influenza, before air travel, influenza went global. There's plagues that affected the Romans, like and then killed emperors and then, you know, thousands of years ago. So it doesn't seem like Air travel alone can get us there in terms of an explanation. Another possible idea is that the human population itself has changed. And one thing that's noticeably different is human populations on average are much older. So are aging populations more vulnerable to spillover? And you could think of adaptive immunity waning or diminishing uh, in elderly populations, providing this large, immunologically naive or vulnerable population. Another possible idea is that spillover is common, but a lot of those viruses that spill over have difficulties with compatibility to the host. You can imagine if the virus requires a very specific receptor, humans may not have the right receptor in the right location. But evidence against that is that coronaviruses are extremely diverse. They affect rodents, pangolins, whatever a pangolin is. I can't remember if it's a rodent or an anteater relative or something. Bats, camels, as we mentioned. And so coronaviruses clearly show the ability to affect a wide range of hosts. In addition, SARS-CoV-2 not only affects humans, but is spilled back into a vast range of animals. Um, there was a, at one point, the, the story where mink were infected with humans, the virus mutated in mink and then spilled back into humans after it spilled back into mink, um, caught some attention. There's an epidemic of coronavirus among wild deer populations currently. So if this receptor host compatibility was a really you know, fine, a uh, really limited, constrained thing. We wouldn't expect a virus to go from bats to humans to deer and do just fine. Also, coronaviruses that infect humans have come out of various different hosts from all over the coronavirus phylogeny or evolutionary tree, indicating that there's not some special suite of features that makes coronaviruses likely to infect humans, potentially. And the coronaviruses that have infected humans use a variety of receptors. SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1 or SARS-CoV use ACE2. MERS uses DPP4. Other endemic coronaviruses use other receptors. So they're not constrained. It doesn't seem like there's an insane amount of constraint on receptor use. But one potentially interesting idea is that the host immunity is limiting. The human, system, the human immune system, there's adaptive immunity that can learn from previous pathogen exposures 
and then prevent or provide protection to future pathogen exposure. And if we look at this data that I showed from Scotland before, and if you squint at the data and you buy this, it's not the clearest pattern. But if I look at this data, I see, for example, when orange is big, indicating the, the number of patients that are testing positive for 229E, pink is small. So it seems like there's some like competition or offsetting there. And it could be when there's a spike in infection by one coronavirus, a lot of people get their immunity to that coronavirus boosted, and that prevents the other one or sort of squashes the other one. I'm using very general terms here, and I can get into the details more. And we wrote about this in a manuscript last year. And so one way to think of this is if we imagine, like the, if we make a 2D map of all the different Confirm, we, take, we think about a virus, a coronavirus, and that antigen it uses to infect the host, all the possible confirmations it could have, and we make that a 2D map. Let's just abstractly say we can make that, we can plot that in two dimensions. What the sort of hypothesis is, is that large fractions of that map are covered by pre existing immunity to other coronaviruses that are already circulating. And so, for example, a virus that's like here, a, a new mutant or variant of a virus that situates here. It's too close to this center of immunity to an existing virus, and so it suffers. Its fitness suffers. It, gets, it, do, it can't do well because a lot of the host population already has immunity that covers that portion of the, of the map. And just to uh, catch, to, to restate what I've gone through here quickly, coronavirus, for coronavirus, it seems like a small number, given that there's three spillovers in the last two decades. And there's potential, there's potential problems with our data collection or reasons to think that multiple things are at play. Um, but the answer must lie at this intersection between transmission, virulence, existing immune cross protection. So the virus has to sort of be able to transmit, and that's partially limited by human travel. It has to be able to infect humans without killing them too fast. It has to be able to deal with pre existing immunity in the population. And so we kind of get this notion or this metaphor, we can think of the virus has to thread this needle. It has to be with the right virulence, the right transmission, and the right position on that like, immune landscape to avoid existing immunity, to make it through and establish as a new human pathogen. And if threading that needle is difficult, even though there's a lot of viral spillover and there's a lot of connection between humans and animal reservoirs, that could explain why so few of them I, here I'm arguing that there's too few coronaviruses for what we would expect, which is a weird thing to argue, right? Like, obviously there's too many coronaviruses for everybody's well-being, but sort of given the dynamics of play, we might expect a lot, and maybe just threading that needle is difficult. And so I just wanted to wrap up by visualizing this real quick. Um, is we can think of, like, the, again, we have this landscape, and now we make it 3D, where you can be higher up, like, the higher you are, the, the higher your fitness is. If you're the, the, the viral fitness is higher, the higher you are in this landscape. So you have different uh, coronaviruses emerging, um, and then they're sort of like going towards different fitness peaks. Uh, just an important note is that some of these coronavirus lineages, SARS-CoV-2 lineages, have had convergent evolution where they have the same mutations appearing repeatedly. But it seems to be like this pattern where you have a sort of a coronavirus ancestor that then explores the space and tries to climb a fitness peak seems to be holding to date. But one thing, if you compare these two maps, is if we think about early in the epidemic, there's some viruses going towards this alpha peak. Alpha was one of the early variants. But as there's more alpha virus circulating, there's more immunity in the population against the alpha variant. And so being closer to that hill actually becomes negative. So that hill becomes a valley. So if you're a variant, that a, a mutation creates a variant that's too close to where that alpha was. So many people have been exposed and now are immune to alpha. It's better to be far from there. So this landscape is dynamic, is the point I'm trying to make. And the last, I wanted to conclude here by just zooming out. And we can think of all those variants that are evolving and playing in the SARS-CoV-2 landscape or in this broader landscape where there's other coronaviruses circulating. And one concrete example that's potentially interesting from this paper that's referenced up in the top is there was a coronavirus from cats that spilled over and infected a couple of humans. But what was observed is it was fairly similar to this existing coronavirus 229E, and it sort of failed to establish onward spread and just disappeared over time. So that new emergent, perhaps why it, it disappeared, was not because there wasn't enough human travel. Again, this happened recently or anything like that. It's just it happened to land somewhere in the landscape where there was a lot of immunity already existing. And so this landscape sort of like 
how we think of this landscape, and if we can quantify this, um, will be useful to our understanding of pathogen diversity. I just wanted to conclude with a call of collecting data to make this landscape go from theoretical to observed, where we can use new immunological techniques and create something like a global immunological observatory to actually map that out and identify where in the landscape humans are vulnerable, where emergent pathogens are in reference to other existing endemic pathogens and things like that. Um, and just again, to thank my postdoc advisor, Jess Metcalf, who led all this work. Cool, I'll conclude there. Thank you. Thank you so much for that talk, Dr. Rice. So we'll open the floor up to questions, and if you all want to come up here as well. Um, the time points, like how, how long are those, those between those time points? Because you're saying something like, you know, the, the storm blew away the mosquitoes, and my experience with storms of that nature, they don't stay away very long. So how, how long are your time points? Uh, on average, about 45 days between an individual being sampled. They get sampled every month and a half. It varies a little bit because like when the storm came through, like the waterways weren't passable for a while. So I think uh, the mosquito, to respond to the second portion of the question, I think the mosquitoes come back fast, but if the older mosquitoes that were carrying parasites got washed away, the mosquitoes come back in you know, a you couple days, fresh. but then uh, the parasite takes a couple weeks to uh, develop. Um, there's a question that like further data and some modeling would get at is like how, for how long does the mosquito population have to be suppressed in order to observe an effect on transmission is, is a, is a great that's question. A really, that's a really interesting point. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. In terms of the, I forget what specific graph it was, but when I was looking between the different types of um, prevalence between different communities in a particular region and you all saw that there are different rates of different households getting infected. Um, was there any consideration in terms of like, I guess, not just how they were using their bed nets, but also familial behaviors? Were they going out during dusk and dawn? Were they near a particular sewer site? Were they having stagnant water near them? Um, was there any consideration of those potentially confounding variables? Thank you. Definitely, it's an excellent question. Um, and like how you define confounding versus important variables is like a matter of perspective. Two comments on that. One is that uh, one pattern we're observing is a lot of the households, they'll have a primary household in the community in the village here, and they'll have a secondary temporary household for agricultural work. And so for some fractions of the month, they're not at this village, they're at a different temporary shelter they built near their fields, and the mosquito population and the bed net usage may differ. And so their sort of total cumulative exposure may be sort of an average of the exposure they're observing in these different locales. Um, and that's a really good point that we're trying to follow up more. Um, in terms of behavior, there's also uh, people can use the bed net, but if they stay up till 10 p.m. before going under the bed net, they could get bitten even though they're sleeping under the bed net. Sort of those like dusk activities and what people are doing and the schedules is interesting. In this area, some people go out fishing, and while they're like fishing in the open ocean, they're not getting bit. They're like processing the catch and going from household to the water edge. And they'll, they'll, that will be at nighttime. So nighttime activities and uh, human movement would be interesting as well. Dr. Sura has a project looking at people who travel between districts as well. Um, but I think I'll leave it at that. This is a great question. So I'm uh, a bioengineering PhD student. I develop drug delivery platforms. Uh, so one thing that really interested me when you were presenting your data is that your baseline case and your T2 time point, or, uh, yeah, your T2 time point, there was a huge drop. Yeah. Then in a lot of the, the sample sets that you were showing, it was then, even though that they were being surveilled uh, and treated at, you know, pretty astronomically high rates compared to, you know, probably other places in Madagascar and Africa, we saw kind of a stagnation yeah. of like, the level of that, which suggests to me that there's something, there's something more happening in, on, in terms of the treatment side as well. So I was wondering where you guys see the deficiency in the current treatments are. Do you think it's patient adherence? Uh, is it you know, availability? I guess what kind of treatments are you giving people and what are the design rules that you're seeing that could improve those treatments? Yeah, I'll add a little comment and then I might tag in my colleague, Dr. Mahiri, to talk more about the treatment. Um, so we provide treatments, ACTs, artemisinin, and combination therapies, and they only last three days. And so what I think is happening is the infection, the, those medicines clear the infection, 
Um, but not everybody is treated, and then people are traveling, and some para parasites are still inside the mosquitoes. So we clear the infection, and that cuts down in the transmission, and the person gets reinfected as that drug leaves the system. So uh, previous malaria treatments that we can no longer use because there's resistance against them, they're really long half-life, where they persist, like after you took a dose, you couldn't get reinfected for 45 days or something in chloroquine. Um, uh, so the ideal profile would be to extend a little bit more, but I would uh, uh, treatment adherence, like how people take the medicine and the medicines we use. Uh, are there any issues with difficulties with people like Tumaneki, Mahinana, Lehana, Kudis? Yeah, like a. Uh, thank you for your question. You know, uh, the main medicine for the treatment of malaria is uh, what we call ACT. So normally, the patient should take it for three days. And sometimes, when you give the when you when we give them the the, the medicine, they just take for one day, and they and they are not uh, cured. You understand? Because uh, there are patients that they, when we do the test, they are positive, but they don't have any sign or symptoms. So sometimes they don't believe that they have the the, the disease. You understand? That's why. I think the, the ACTs are commonly thought to like make people tired and weary. And so if you're asymptomatic and you have a lot of work to do, taking mids that are going to make you feel weak for three days. So I guess I would add to that profile, long lasting and uh, palatable to asymptomatic but positive uh, individuals. Um, yeah, I had a really good question. Um, earlier in the presentation, you had a slide that kind of showed the um, like how um, various regions had access to bed nets and other preventive measures for malaria. And I was just kind of wondering, like, is there a reason why we see um, the regional like classification and like, are there any ways to overcome those boundaries and like kind of help, help um, provide access to bed nets for areas that don't have um, had them already? Correct. Uh, maybe a question for Dr. Sura, like why for uh, the bed nets bed nets like why some districts have less bed net usage than others. Yeah, it's a great question. I'm going to turn to my colleague who managed the malaria bed net distribution in Madagascar for the last couple of years. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the last uh, mass campaign was in 2020-21 last year. So uh, we have uh, shared uh, many bed nets to, to the household for the around for to the uh, 100 more than 100 districts. So uh, when they have the, the bed net, they don't use for uh, to protect them during the net. So they use for the other rays like uh, fishing, protect her uh, uh, agriculture, agriculture. Yeah. agriculture. Like this, so uh, days with net doesn't uh, uh, introduce in the data at the THS2. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.